Good morning, everyone. So it's my great pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker for today, um, Kevin Foster. So Kevin's lab is at the University of, of Oxford, where he has been a, a, full, professor, a full professor since uh, 2010. Now, the focus of uh, Kevin's research is the evolution of social behaviors. His uh, research sort of stands out because he has been using a very integrative approach. So he has been using the full range of available methods and he has been studying social behavior using those methods at every level of biological organization. So he has been looking at uh, gene level, at the level of individuals, groups of individuals, and most um, recently uh, has been looking at social evolution in uh, communities. Um, he originally got his PhD from the University of Sheffield in 2000, and then he has been holding a number of personal fellowship, fellowships that allowed him to work in different places, um, mainly. So he started working at, uh, uh, at Rice University. He then spent some time at the Wissenschaftskolleg to Berlin, and he also worked in Finland um, as well as in Harvard. Now, if you look sort of diagonally across uh, Kevin's CV and across his publications, there is sort of one keyword that stands out. So he says his main focus is the evolution of social behaviors, but actually the main keyword you find in his list of publication is not social behavior, but conflict. So how social behaviors can evolve in spite of all these conflicts at all possible um, levels when they can occur, I guess Kevin is going to give us some insights into this uh, during his talk today. Is that on? Yeah. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, well, it's a real pleasure to give a talk here. So many people, slightly daunting, but nevertheless, uh, a real pleasure. So yeah, so in recent years, I've got really interested in microorganisms. Um, and obviously, that's the focus of my talk today. But sort of the theme with some conflict in there too, underlying my research is very much how we get cooperation in biological systems. And this is obviously one of these classic questions in evolutionary biology that you can trace all the way back to Darwin. And you know, one of the nice things about Darwin's writings is he sort of set himself up to fail. He would point out the things that were problematic for his theory as well as the new ideas. And he did that with cooperation. And this is one of my favorite quotes from him where he sort of asks um, or challenges you to find a trait that evolved in one organism for the exclusive good of another. And um, yeah, and indeed, if you find such a thing, you know, this would cause a problem for, for his theory. And of course, he didn't think it was that much of a problem. Um, and he gave, himself gave some good solutions to how cooperation can evolve. And those solutions very much sort of um, set the stage for all that's followed in this field. And there's obviously a number of explanations out there now, but one of the key explanations that we see time and time again, of course, is family life. Why would you invest in a family member? Well, for the simple reason that genetically they're more similar to you than they are to the population. And so in some ways, they're passing on some of you uh, when they reproduce. And indeed, you know, studies of animals of diverse forms um, including things like the social insects, which is where I did my, what I did my PhD on. That's the hornet Vespa crabro, the first thing I did as, an, as a graduate student was to study those guys. And if you look at these, these systems, then you see good evidence that there's an association between relatedness, um, so family life, and cooperation. And of course, this is made most famous in the sort of classic paper of Hamilton. And I'm sure many of you, or all of you, know Hamilton and Hamilton's rule. But obviously, now I've got sort of interested in another group of organisms that also live in communities, um, and they also have the potential for family life, where well, they, they reproduce by binary fission. And, and, um, but it's not always clear how much they interact with their own types and other types, and these, of course, are the microbes. And the microbes are everywhere. Um, they're on us, inside us, uh, uh, as, as we sit here or stand here. Um, and what we've realized is that much of what microbes do, they do in dense communities where they're sort of strongly interacting. 
And this isn't just sort of competition, although it will be a big theme in my talk. It's also cooperation. So these guys secrete all kinds of enzymes and factors into the environment around them that help other cells to grow. And indeed, many key sort of disease phenotypes of bacteria rely on these kind of secretions. So we have this um, sort of dense, interacting world of microorganisms where there's both things that help and harm others around them, and it starts to look very much like the subjects that we study in animal behavior. And so, and this is very much what my lab and others have been doing. So just to give you a quick sort of reminder, who are the microbes? Well, phylogenetically, they're basically all of life. Um, but of course, um, I, like many of you, also have strong interests in the multicellular organisms. I started off studying wasps. Um, but yeah, so to get your sort of anchors down on the far right of this slide are the animals. Um, but then everything else with some plants and fungi on the way through and some algae are, are, are microbes. And in particular, I'll be focusing today on the bacteria, the most intensely studied of the microbes and also the ones that affect us the most. There's the archaea, which are sort of extremophiles often live in strange places, but they also are increasing, increasingly studied. And then I'll also be talking a little bit about yeast, so, uh, the, which is all the way over here. So you'll get a bit of prokaryote and eukaryote microbial life today. So, but what does a social behavior look like in a, a microbial group? And indeed, what would sort of the argues of someone like Hamilton, arguments of someone like Hamilton look like were we to um, uh, uh, sort of run it through? So here's a thought experiment that I like to start my talks with. So, is this on? No, good. Um, that I like to start my talk with that sort of gives you an idea of what it will look like. So we're going to do a little thought experiment where we have a white cell, and that cell is not going to do anything very much, but then you're going to have a red cell that's going to secrete a factor that helps everyone to grow. We're going to make this an enzyme that allows, that breaks down uh, uh, complex food stuff in the environment and then feeds all the cells around it. So, and it's going to pay a cost to do this. And if we do this in our experiment, so it secretes the factor, um, in a well-mixed case, well, what's it, what it's doing is it's feeding everyone around it, but it's only it's paying the cost. And so then we get the sort of classic problem of cooperation emerging, that these guys, basically, all else being equal, might lose out. But now we'll do one simple manipulation. We're going to just group them together. We're going to make a little family group. And now we can ask the same question in our thought experiment. Um, so we've got a little clone of cells. Now, when they secrete their factor, they're going to preferentially affect their own type. And we might expect, under these conditions, that they do rather well, because they're the ones benefiting and no one else is. So again, this sort of illustrates you know, the basic ideas that family life may be important for cooperation in microbes, as we know it is in animals. And so, yeah, indeed, you might make this prediction from this very simple model that um, under these conditions, you might actually want to secrete an antibiotic or something, be competitive, whereas here, um, you might want to be cooperative. OK. So I've divided my talk up into three parts, and that sort of will go up in scale as, as I go through them. But the first, first part I'm going to focus on is, is these interactions between cells of the same genotype, often clone mates? Then I'll start discussing what happens when we see interactions with other genotypes, so different strains and species. And then finally, we're going to put all of this sort of evolving system inside a host and then ask what happens there. So, but the, first of all, let's think about interactions with your own genotype. And so particularly, the sort of obvious question is, well, do they live in family groups? And indeed, what determines whether they do? So does a microbe tend to interact with its own genotype or other, other genotypes? And this is something we've been studying for quite a few years. It's the first thing that I really worked on in microbes. And we've looked at it in various contexts. Um, but I'm just going to show you a couple of movies, both from an individual-based model. We use a lot of those to sort of explore ideas, and from a real experiment. And in both cases, um, both in silico and in the Petri dish, all we've done is mix together two colors of the same genotype. So there's nothing going on sort of in a very interesting way, but we're just asking how do they pattern as they grow. And you'll see basically similar things in both cases. So if I run the individual base model, then the cells are growing and dividing, but we're also calculating nutrient gradients and, nutri and diffusion in these, exper in these uh, simulations. And what happens is you get something I like to say looks a bit like broccoli. Um, but the key point is that each floret of the broccoli is a different color. And so what's happened is it started off very uh, uh, well mixed, and it's become demixed. Why does it happen? Well, because with nutrient limitation, only the cells on the outside can grow. You get bottlenecks, you get genetic drift, and you end up with clonal groups. So nothing fancy going on. Um, but indeed, you see the same thing if you do an experiment with this pathogen, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which I'll be talking about a lot. We've just put down two different fluorescently labeled uh, uh, cell types, the same strain, but over time they'll segregate into this rather beautiful petunia-like pattern where they've, they've actually ended up largely next to their own genotype. 
So as cells grow and divide, just because of local spatial structure, you do get the emergence of local uh, genetic structure. So does this help for cooperation? Well, indeed it does, as you might expect intuitively, and we can show that in a model. And so this, in this simulation, we've got different colors, I apologize. In this simulation, the blue guy is going to secrete a factor that helps everyone to grow. It can be an enzyme again. And then the red one's uh, saving energy by not doing that. And if you were to mix these guys in like sort of a broth, then the non-secretor would outgrow very quickly the secretor. But if you do this um, under conditions um, of spatial structure, then you get the emergence of these strong patterns, and indeed the blue guys basically form their own little groups, and they get to help themselves. So we can solve the problem of cooperation just by allowing microbes to grow under conditions where they spatially structure, so you just need some nutrient limitation, and indeed you don't need much for this to happen. So far, so good. So this is obviously in theory. Does it happen in practice? Well, at least in the lab, um, there's been a number of studies showing that exactly this phenomenon will occur quite reliably. And um, there's studies from other labs. This is a Harvard and MIT lab studying yeast, and a study from my own lab showing that indeed you can find these things, the same processes is going on. Um, because those ones are published, though, I wanted to run through one rather nice unpublished example in our lab we're doing at the moment, where we're looking at antibiotic resistance um, in, a, in a group of bacteria. And this is, again, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. You'll hear that, that species many times. It's the key one we work on. It's this opportunistic pathogen that causes all kinds of problems in the clinic, and it's very antibiotic resistant. And in this case, we're studying a strain that carries an enzyme that it secretes into the outside media, and this enzyme um, will break down um, antibiotics. So it sort of eclips them. It doesn't actually break them down. It clips, modifies them, and stops them from working. But it does it socially. It releases it into the environment. So a cell nearby can make use of another guy's antibiotic. And However, if you make a colony of these guys under conditions where you get this segregation, we can put down the resistance strain, paying the cost, um, uh, but making the environment resistant and the susceptible. And what you see is you get these fans again. You get these yellow fans of resistance strain um, uh, uh, forming that, that basically dominate and, and they, they sort of win the competition. So this looks very much like the theme. You know, it looks like you're getting relatedness emerging in a group and cooperation being stable. But we want to test that, right? We want to test if it is actually the relatedness that is critical. And this is one of these nice things. I mean, microbes have very many annoying things about studying them, including the fact they're really, really small. <laughs> but um, <laughs> But the one nice thing is that at the population scale, you can manipulate relatedness very easily. And this is exactly what the graduate student on this project, Izzy, did. She just took a pipette tip and, and redid the experiment, took a pipette tip and just mixed up the colony. And so each day you mix it up. And then you ask, do I see the same outcome? And indeed you don't. Um, we have proper data on this, but I'm just going to show you the picture today. Just by mixing up the colony each day, it changes color. Why does it change color? Because you've increased the access of the sort of cheaters, if you like, these guys that don't make the antibiotic resistance to the resistant guys, and suddenly they actually dominate the group. And so hopefully this, this sort of in a, in a, in a Petri dish uh, illustrates um, the principles of, of um, social evolution happening, and indeed in a relevant phenotype. So... And if you're interested, uh, Izzy, whose project this is, is here, and she'll be giving a poster tomorrow on this and actually much more than just this experiment. Okay, so Hamilton taught us that relatedness is important, and we can indeed, with a bit of translation, see exactly that going on in the microbes. But another key idea that comes from evolutionary biology in general and Hamilton is this idea of costs and benefits. And what we expect is I should help um, preferentially under conditions where it's low cost to me and high benefit to you. It good, makes good evolutionary sense. And we see the same things happening in the microbes. Um, and so I'm just going to run you a movie because it's, it's a rather nice movie to show a phenotype. So on the right, we have a wild type, again, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and it's going to do something called swarming behavior. And this is a mix of secreting a, a chemical that allows you to spread out across the plate, so they're swimming collectively. Um, um, but, you also, yeah, but you need the secretion to do it. And in this strain, we've deleted the secretion, so they can't make it. And what you'll see is these guys just sit there. They can't move because they've not got the secretion needed to break surface tension and move. But the moment they meet this guys, then they can do it together. You'll see that because they're labeled. So basically, this guy can exploit this guy's phenotype. So we thought when we mixed these guys up properly and studied them that we would see sort of this a phenotype where we'd lose cooperation. But you don't. In fact, what you see is that these two strains are entirely neutral if you grow them together over time. 
And this puzzled us for a long time because this guy is investing 25 to 50 percent of its carbon in the secretion needed to move. So it's doing this huge investment, it seemed, in, in the secretion, and yet it doesn't actually seem to pay a cost. So why is this? Well, after looking at some sort of fairly gnarly um, uh, metabolism and regulation and doing a lot more work, we realize that the bacteria are doing something very clever. And what they're doing is they only turn on this secretion, which is a carbon-rich secretion, when they have excess carbon, so more carbon than they need, for, need to grow. So basically, if there's, not, if there's not enough carbon, it's limiting. They put it straight into growth. They don't, they don't mess. But the moment they have a lot of carbon, then they shunt it out in this secretion that allows them to, to move out and do other things. And so um, it's a simple regulatory trick, but it's a very savvy way, evolutionarily speaking, to, to operate. They only turn something on where it has almost effectively no cost. So both, we see both, then, the trace of this idea of this low cost-to-benefit ratio and, and relatedness in the microbes. So this led us recently, um, in particular with Sarah Mitri, who's actually now back at Lausanne, she was in my lab for a few years, um, uh, to sort of come up with a sort of general view of, of, of how we view cooperation and competition between microbes. And this paper is written, I mean, I do hope you will read it, but this paper is very much written for the microbiologists to try and sort of um, uh, 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 explain the simple intuition that we get from evolutionary biology. And in particular, we emphasize that it's the genotype that matters. If you're the same genotype, then cooperation can be favored. But if you're a different genotype, we might expect competition. And we say genotype rather than clone or such, because horizontal transfer in bacteria can actually sort of break down uh, genome correlations. So they have a slightly weird um, uh, aspect to them in that sense. And so this is summarized nicely in a cartoon one of my students, uh, friends did for us. Um, uh, where well, these guys are obviously the same genotype. Okay, so this is all to say, and I think it's really important for this audience to sort of uh, make the links that, that you know, what we're finding is sort of, we're finding the sort of trace of Hamilton in the microbes very much. We see that they cooperate when they're related, and we see that they cooperate preferentially when there's a high uh, benefit to cost ratio. And so in some ways, yeah, we're translating Hamilton for microbes. And indeed, if you go back to original Hamilton, you realize he does need some translation. Um, and this is actually sort of the first time his famous rule turns up in one of his papers. And um, I mean, I'm sure you all read Hamilton's original paper, right? I mean, I did it years ago, to be fair. And, um, and this is the rule. <laughs> Minus k has got to be greater than 1 over r circle. Um, that well-known rule that we all understand. I do think that sometimes he deliberately wrote things in the most obscure way possible. I mean, this is, of course, is BR over C, greater than C. But if you can find a more difficult way to write that expression, <laughs> I will be impressed. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> okay. Very good. So, so, yeah, so we see this sort of simple ideas of Hamilton born out, but perhaps with the currency of genotype or clonality. But, of course, microbes don't just interact with their own type. They interact with many different genotypes. And so we also have to think about what happens when those other genotypes are out there, and, like, what happens if you do meet um, a, an unrelated cell. And so this part, we're going to focus on that. And, indeed, you find some rather interesting, perhaps new things um, in this arena. So we can keep with Hamilton for a bit. So what's the key prediction? The key prediction from, from a Hamiltonian sense is if you keep being bombarded and interact, forced to interact with other genotypes, you should start to learn or evolve to discriminate. And we see exactly that. So, and microbes do often do things in a way that's sort of incredibly simple, but also incredibly clever with hindsight. So how do they do it? Well, this is um, an example from yeast. And so these guys make this um, a, a, a protein called Flow1. It's actually a mucus-related protein, um, for, the, for those of you that like mucus. Um, and um, and it, it sticks out from the cell, and it, it allows you to stick to other cells. And under stress, they aggregate and protect themselves collectively. And it costs a lot to make this protein. So then the question is, you know, can a guy that doesn't make the protein get in there and exploit the cells that do? Um, but the answer is no, um, because if you make the protein, then basically you preferentially stick to other cells that also make the protein, which is a green beard gene for those of you that, that like your social evolution. But let me just show you the phenotype. So on the left is a calcium-dependent process. On the left, we have um, the flocculating cells. On the right, these are guys where we just deleted it. I mean, this doesn't show the discrimination, it just shows how powerful a phenotype it is. These guys, under the right conditions, will aggregate and drop out solution. And the cool thing is then, just with one gene, they can find the other guys that have that gene. So it's direct gene-gene recognition, which is very uncommon uh, uh, anywhere else, outside of cells, uh, probably. So even more simple than that, because that's 
has some sophistication to it, is just not to let go at all. And so as you divide, you don't necessarily have to let go of that cell. And so what we see in yeast again, these again brewing and budding yeast, um, is that in natural yeast populations, cells don't actually divide properly, and they'll actually make these little clumps. And you can show that if you make that clump, you're much better at using secreted enzymes to grow and such. So, so they have these very good ways of, of solving things. And I should have acknowledged my collaborators on these projects. So um, these are both done in my time at Harvard with um, extremely good yeast biologists who I had the pleasure to work with. Kevin Verstrepen uh, is, worked, worked with on this project, and Andrew Murray particularly on this project. Okay. So, okay. So, so we see kin discrimination in, of a form, but it's not. It, it's simple and elegant, but it is very simple. If you were to sort of approach a hornet's colony, as I did many times during my PhD, you might be faced with something like this. And this individual is a worker of a hornet colony, and it's in its like attack pose. This is basically if you prod them with a stick, they look a bit like this. Um, not that I would ever do that, of course. Um, and what these guys are doing on the outside is they're guarding the colony, and they're discriminating who comes in. Obviously, I'm easy to discriminate against, but they'll also discriminate um, own colony members from other colony members using sort of the cuticular hydrocarbons. So these guys make behavioral decisions as and when to respond for or against an individual that is or isn't kin. So for a long time, I was interested in whether we would see this in microbes. I came from the social insects, and I really thought we would see it. And so I spent a lot of time and money, thankfully half as money, so <laughs> that's okay, um, uh, trying to find sort of kin discrimination in microbes. And after years of going in the wrong direction, we think, we think they do actually do it, but they do it in a slightly weird and perhaps even more clever way. So this is the question, does, do they do active kin discrimination? And there are some nice examples, specific ones where they do. But in fact, we think actually now they solve this problem in a, perhaps an even better way. So they don't discriminate between Kin and non-kin, they discriminate between things that are going to mess with them or hurt them and things that aren't. So I need to explain a little bit of uh, microbiology to you here, but basically we're going to focus on these things called stress responses. And this is a project with uh, Dan Cornforth, now at uh, UT Austin. And when we started chatting, we realized that there's these sort of classical types of uh, uh, divisions you can make in ecology, and these actually match up to this set of things called stress responses in bacteria. And now bacterial stress responses are intensively studied because this is the way that if we try and kill them, that they don't get killed. So there's a huge interest in understanding how they respond to stress and why they respond to stress in such a good way in many conditions and they just won't die. Um, but actually, with a bit of evolution in ecology, you suddenly realize that actually these stress responses probably didn't evolve to, to deal with us, right? We're a new invention from their evolutionary landscape. They evolved to deal with each other. And what we noticed is you can partition up these general different stress responses, don't worry about the names particularly, um, into sort of these classic sort of things from ecology, you know, basically fighting for food, actually fighting, or then something else that isn't biological. So we got wondering, well, maybe they're using these stress responses to make a very simple discrimination. Am I being harmed? If so, I should worry about it. There's a non-kin out there causing problems. But we wanted an exclusive prediction to our hypothesis that wasn't just sort of lining up definitions. And so we reasoned that if you feel competition from another cell, you might want to fight back, right? If you, someone kicks you, you might, you might want to kick them back. Maybe not if you're a civilized person, but um, nevertheless, the instinct might be there. And however, if you get sunburnt, you may or may not get angry with the sun. If you do get angry with the sun, you might want to think again. <laughs> I would probably get angry with the sun. Um, anyway, so we have a prediction. Bacteria under biotic stresses should, make, should fight back, they should make toxins. And so we did a very sort of rough sort of um, survey to look at these things in the literature and evaluate how often you see a link between a stress regulator, one of these well-studied stress regulators in microbiology, and the secretion of an antibiotic. And then asked, how often is that a biotic stress sensor versus an abiotic stress sensor? And this is, this is not phylogenetic, phylogenetically controlled, um, although you do see things in, in men occurring in multiple branches, but the, the trend is very promising. You see 75 cases in the literature where there's biotic stress is associated with um, uh, 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 toxin secretion, and we can only find two, and actually one of these goes in the wrong direction. So we came up with this idea then, we called it competition sensing, and we're arguing then that actually the way that bacteria make this important distinction is not by actively telling who is kin and non-kin, it's by responding to when they're attacked. And since then, there's been 
um, studies that really are showing these kind of things going on in, in fine detail. And this is one example. Um, so these are, this is from two different labs um, in Streptomyces bacteria. And you may have heard of Streptomyces um, because these are the guys that are sort of factories for the antibiotics that we use um, uh, in, in, in the clinic. And Streptomyces are in the soil everywhere, and they're sort of fierce competitors. They spend a lot of time and investment in, uh, uh, in um, antibiotics to kill each other. And this is literally sort of the one, sort of the one uh, uh, image that sort of tells the whole story because they make a red antibiotic. Um, and you can see here that on this guy, you've got streptomyces coelacolor, which is the well-intensively studied strain, and it makes these two red pigmented antibiotics. And you can see that, actually, if you grow it under this condition normally, which is basically this side of it, you won't, it won't make the antibiotic, but put down another guy next to it, and it will. And indeed, we know these antibiotics are regulated by stress responses. They do it under nutrient limitation and under envelope damage. And so these guys are responding to, to the challenge of a competitor by upregulating. Um, they fight back, upregulating their antibiotics. Okay, so it really does look like they have this sort of clever and simple way of, of solving this problem of how to detect when you've got non-kin around, but particularly non-kin that are going to cause you problems. But what about other phenotypes? And indeed, when I, when, when I started my slightly... Um, listless hunt for a kin selection, or sorry, kin recognition system in bacteria, I didn't start on antibiotics. I started on something called biofilm formation. And so biofilms um, are a word, if you're a microbiologist, that you hear all the time, to, perhaps to the point of exhaustion, um, but I realize you guys may not have heard, um, heard this term. It's one of these sort of key words in microbiology. So what is a biofilm? Well, a biofilm is anything you want it to be, unfortunately, in practice, but at least in some cases, people try and define it down to when cells will land on a surface, attach to a surface, and then form a community. In some ways, a colony that I showed you earlier is also a biofilm, but the canonical ones are that involve this attachment process, and then they'll form this group, and then they'll be dispersed. Okay, so why do we care about biofilms so much? Well, they're important in many infections. These things are massively antibiotic resistant and so on. And so they've had a huge amount of effort um, uh, uh, pointed at them, particularly with how, how do you get rid of them. But I asked a different question, um, which is actually what happens when you mix up strains, when different genotypes meet in a biofilm? And this is where I was looking you know, for this sort of idea that there would be kin recognition. And so this is, a, this is one of many experiments in, in a recently published paper, but I'll just get, you give, get the gist from one. You take two different genotypes, and now these are properly different strains, so different, genetically different strains, isolated um, from different, different places in this case. You mix them together, they attach to the surface of this flow cell, and then you flow nutrients over them gent gently, and you allow them to grow. Okay? And we can do this um, under conditions, actually, where the two colors are the same genotype, or the two colors are a different genotype. Um, it's easiest to show things with a movie, and so I'm just going to show you the case. So we've got 7Y, and there's 7C in the background, and we've got 7Y, the same strain here, but with a different genotype in the background. And I'm just showing you the yellow color, because the um, blue imaging doesn't come out very well in these movies. But basically what you see is, when you have another guy present, you get a much thicker and much more um, a resilient biofilm. There's many more cells of... of, of of this guy than there are both, of the, both types in this. What's happening? Well, they're inducing this group formation stuff. They basically don't detach so much. So they, they invest really in staying put and form these very thick biofilms. So when we saw this, this is where we started to think, oh, there is kin recognition. But in fact, um, when we actually studied what causes the response, we found something that actually looks much more like competition sensing. And so after some chemistry and um, what you can do with these guys, right, you can grow up a strain that another one will respond to. You grow it up, you take the cells out, and now you have the liquid that that strain has been growing in with all the factors in it that will affect this guy. Then you can add that back and then try and recapitulate the phenotypes. And then from that, you can then fractionate it, do some chemistry, and then try and work out what it is causing, what factor is causing this response. And if you do that, again, with hindsight, it's something that's blindingly obvious, it's actually an antibiotic. Um, well, it's actually kind of an interesting antibiotic. It's these things, which are called R-piacins, and these things are, are a, a sort of cruel and clever trick of, of, of bacteria. These are tamed phages. So phages are the viruses. You know the sort of moon lander phage thing that lands on a cell and injects DNA. Well, if you cut off the top of that, you just have a stabby thing. And that's what the bacteria have evolved to do. They've, they've got these phage tails that don't no longer inject any bacteria. They just punch holes. They literally sort of eviscerate other bacteria. And, if, and you can show, actually, that these guys are responsible for this phenotype. 
So how do we how do we do that? Just to give an example of the kind of experiments we would do. So this is a flow cell, and we'll come back to these uh, again in, uh, later, where we can do something a bit more sophisticated. Not really. We put nutrients in one side, and in the other side, we're going to put um, uh, nutrients again, but then also this sort of media where, the, where an, another strain that this strain responds to has been growing. So we can do that in a control condition. This is just sort of two, two um, TB, so two triptone broths, and this is what it looks like um, after 24 hours. Okay, so now we can then put in the media of a strain that we know when they mix, you respond to, and you see what you'd expect. You see toxicity in the bottom half, but then you see this induction of the biofilm in the top. So they make these, they basically hunker down and form this big group. But then what we can do is, of course, delete the gene that the, the sort of attacker strain, the one that's just left in the media, the actual cells aren't there, we can delete the gene of that guy that makes these piercins, makes these antibiotics, so that's a whole load of them. Um, that it makes. We take out that regulator, and then now we can wash that supernatum, which is identical except for the toxins, and ask what that looks like. And as you see, the phenotype will revert back to uh, the original. And indeed, it turns out that you can take almost any antibiotic you like and see this phenotype. So it's not specific to this one particular curious phage tail. You can take any of your clinical antibiotics, and people have seen this before, and you will see these inductions. And so what this says is that these cells have this very general response to damage that is both to fight back, but also sort of hunker down and form a group. At least that's our current interpretation. Okay. So... Studying these cells at this sort of group level was very interesting, and I think it sort of helped us to think much better about how they respond to things and how they solve this problem of living in a world where there's both things you want to cooperate with and things you want to compete with. But on this journey, we also got interested in sort of uh, another question, which is like, how sensitive are they to these discriminations? And how good are bacteria at telling sort of friend from foe or indeed identifying anything in their environment? And the reason we ask this is because so far we've been looking at these global population responses, really, or at least group-level responses. But we know that bacteria should be able to do more than this. So, and this project started um, when two people um, in the lab, uh, Nuno and Mac, started studying these, these flow cells, the ones I just talked about. So in the past, we were putting in this cell-free supernatant here and showing you get more biofilm. But now, they, these guys started just putting all kinds of things in here and just asking how do the cells respond. And in particular, they got interested in motility and how do the cells move um, under these conditions when you put different factors in. And just to remind you then, most of you, if you know about bacterial motility, will be familiar with swimming motility, so flagella, and these are the ways that cells sort of swim around when they're not attached to a surface. But that actually isn't the important form of motility when a cell is in a group, particularly not in the strain we study, which is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So in Pseudomonas and, and some other species, they have something called twitching motility. And this is essentially a molecular grappling hooks. So once they attach to a surface and they don't want to leave, they polymerize out these uh, 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 filaments and then sort of pull themselves along. And, um, and in this way, they can basically maintain their contact with the surface, they can move over other cells, and this is actually how they move around in a social group. And oh, just to give you an idea of what this looks like, this is a movie from Howard Berg's lab at Harvard, and this cell has actually been tethered, so it can't move, but you can see, it's really beautiful, you can see the pili retraction mechanism. One minute. So these guys, basically, they're polymerizing stuff out and then pulling in. This, it's a little bit cruel because this guy's been stuck down, so he can't actually move. But um, don't worry, it gets even more cruel in a minute. Um, okay, so and what we realize is actually people don't know whether these cells can actually really sense chemicals and sense gradients uh, under this system of motility. It's well understood in the swimming, but actually in a social group, we don't know if they can do it. And so this is what we got interested in. And so this is just a test movie to show you the kind of things that we're doing. So in this case, we've got a whole load of cells, and they're in this case, just, it's all just the same nutrient. There's no gradients, there's nothing interesting in here, but this just shows that we can track them. So we track the cells, and in this case, they're color-coded yellow or red by whether they're going up or down, and then blue if they're sort of not going anywhere at all around in a circle. So we can start to track and trace these guys as they move around on a surface. I should say this is sped up. So this is, um, they, they, they're, they're going to move over these distances in a few hours. Um, okay. So, but the interesting one, of course, is to say what happens if we put these guys um, in a gradient. And now I'm going to put them in a gradient of something that it turns out they'd really like. It's called DMSO. You really wouldn't like this, but bacteria have weird tastes. Um, and it turns out that they're very attracted to it. So I'll show you this. 
So now, red guys are guys moving down, and you should be able to see the screen goes bright red at the beginning of the movie. So, and just to remind you, we're flowing in, there's two streams going in, but it's creating this gradient of the DMSO. So they merrily charge downwards. So we got very excited when we saw this, because genuinely no one had seen this, a sort of single cell chemotaxis of this sort in biofilms. So we can quantify it just very quickly, and you can actually ask, okay, what proportion of cells are moving down or moving up at a given time point? And we can call that beta. And if you do that, then basically you see what we saw. You start the system and you see this big spike in movement. Everyone moves down. Presumably they're happy, so to speak, and then they'll just grow there. So then we wanted to see, this is where it gets a little bit cruel, we wanted to see, well, how good are you at this, really? Are you really good at this discrimination? So now what we're going to do is we're going to give them a different, I'm putting a different uh, attractant here just to show it works with multiple things. This is now a sugar succinate they like to eat. And now we're just going to be a bit mean. We're going to flip it backwards and forwards. So they move up. And they're like, yeah, I'm almost there, I'm almost there. Uh, and then you flip it down. Oh, no. <laughs> Let's get back. Um, they seem to say... And you can keep doing this. Admittedly, they, they grow really well in succinate, so they get crowds relatively quickly. Okay, so they look pretty good at this, but we're like, okay, how good are you? Uh, so we kept going. So Mac, who's very good at microfluidics, designed a new system where we could really flip these gradients quickly. In this case, it's going to be every eight minutes. Um, and you can do it cleanly, and you don't have to worry too much about the design, but you need four inlets, and you have to swap between the inlets, basically. And that way you can do these clean, um, clean flips. And then what we also realized is the way they do this is very simple, is if they're going in the wrong direction, and they sense it, they just reverse back. So like, dun, dun, dun. Um, rather than things that are swimming cells, which sort of spin around and do all kinds of um, useless things to track gradients. Um, but let me show you this going on, then. We're going to flip the gradient backwards and forwards, and you're going to see Mac's image analysis software detecting which way they're moving uh, reliably. And it takes a while for them to get warmed up, so we're going to start flipping them. They take, they're, they're a little bit listless at first, but you'll see in a minute, once you see green dots, they start to get it. Yeah. It's that way. Oh, no. It's that way. So the point is that they're really good at this. So they're correcting their movement when they've moved a fraction of their body length. Okay, so they're just moving this tiny amount, and they detect a difference, and they move back. So this tells us that they have very, very refined discrimination capability on an individual cell level, something that we didn't know before. And this is a project that sort of came out kind of accident of just staring at these things. Um, and just to show you a final movie, I mean, we don't know how much this is involved in discriminating self from non-self or harm from not harm, although we have indicated it will be important. But um, these are the kind of movies we're making now, um, with apologies to Jackson Pollock, um, where we follow cells around and, and track where they go. And then we can ask what happens, that red guys are a different genotype to the black guys. We can ask what happens when they meet and how they interact with those conditions. And of course, we can manipulate things. So this work is ongoing, but, but our hope and expectation is we're going to find pretty refined discriminations of the sort you see in, say, social insects when two insects meet, going on also in these microbial groups. But that's work in progress. Okay. So... To summarize then, to sort of genotypic view, we started off with this view that, yes, indeed, cells can end up in a clonal group, and they will cooperate preferentially with their own type. That made sense. Um, but sort of the addition to that from the last part is that also there's a lot of regulation and a lot of discrimination going on as well. It's not, they're not just blunt tools that sort of grow passively and, and secrete things and happen to hit their, their relatives. They're also uh, capable of um, refined discriminations to identify who is friend and who is foe. But, but what's missing from this picture? Well, one thing we haven't talked about, of course, is polar bears. <laughs> He's really nice, isn't he? Um, so, um, and of course, why have I got a polar bear in my talk? There's actually a long story there if you're interested sometime. But um, in this case, the polar bear is here because it's a host. And of course, a lot of these microbial games play out not only in nature, but also inside a host. And that's a very interesting thing, right, for an evolutionary biologist or an ecologist, because now you have exactly what people used to make mistakes about. I mean, people used to think that there was this Gaia stuff going on, right, that a whole system was being controlled by something. Maybe that's a misrepresentation of Gaia. But, but the point is that certainly, historically, people wanted to believe that there was something controlling communities and controlling systems. And we have that inside um, uh, the microbiome systems, inside hosts. You have a host that's evolved specifically to try and change what's going on inside a full community. And so this leads us to the last part then, which is what happens when you have these things in a host? Does it change the rules of, a ga of the game? 
And so this is just sort of a motivating slide to make you think about what we're talking about. So um, I'll show you more statistics later, but the majority of these things are going on down in the lower intestine. And this is a section from a mouse. And these are the epithelial cells, the mucus layer. And then you have these very dense bacterial communities growing on um, uh, and very, very near to the host. And so you have strong, potential for strong interactions. And we know the host is secreting all kinds of factors here to influence this community. So there's, there is this sort of playing God going on. So this sort of led us to wonder then, well, what do these communities look like? Um, and I mean, I haven't talked that much about this work today, but one thing we've been arguing very heavily with good cause from evolutionary biology is that there's a lot of competition in, in sort of natural microbial communities out there. But if you actually look at the microbiome literature, people tend to argue that there are these sort of cooperating sort of uh, 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 superorganisms that, that are all working together to help us. It's a very sort of happy family story. And so you can question whether the host is even capable of controlling things that much. But we wanted to actually ask an even more fundamental question, which is, what does a host want? Does a host even want cooperation in the microbiome, or might they want something else? And we did this just using some simple models. Well, actually, the models get kind of gnarly, but they start very simple, um, just using Locke Volterra type systems of equations. And you can do this and ask, well, how does it affect productivity to have cooperation? But also, perhaps more importantly, you can ask, how does it affect stability? So productivity will, under many conditions, go up with cooperation. But in fact, you have this other really negative effect, and that is the stability of the system. So I'm just going to show you a couple of individual waste models where we change the proportion of cooperative links in, a, in an ecological network. This is really sort of classic ecology. Um, this is just a simulation. And so this is one that is stable, admittedly stable with some, quite a lot of fluctuations. But this is a system that you kick it, it's competitive, everyone's dampened, and they come back. If you do the same thing with a cooperative system, they'll fluctuate all over the place and collapse because of this coupling, the same coupling that we see in many networks. And because I once got absolutely sort of hammered at a math biology conference, I think some people here saw me, this happened to me, um, we pinned this down to show that this is uh, robust using multiple techniques. Um, we started off just using the classic analytic techniques that people have used called linear stability analysis, but then we've now added you know, multiple other techniques. But the point is, it's intuitive. If you have a coupled system of cooperators, it actually really can be a really bad thing for stability. And I should say, the microbiome is noted for its incredible stability. It's a very stable system. You take antibiotics, it messes with it, but more often than not, it'll come straight back. And so this all suggests to us then that actually we can perhaps use these simple models to think about what are the design principles that a host would want in their community. And it's not always the obvious ones, at least not obvious to people in a lot of the literature. Um, and if you do these sort of models, then you predict the following. If you want a stable ecological system, and any ecologist would probably get this intuitively, you want non-cooperative interactions, you know, negative feedbacks, and you actually want relatively weak interactions. So then we can go from our model and make a prediction. This is what we should see in real systems. And do we see this? Well, here we were lucky. Actually, a couple of years ago, um, one of my former postdocs had actually done just this. And so he looked at mouse microbiomes in the lab. They perturbed it with an antibiotic. And then they did this sort of large-scale machine learning to sort of extract the interactions from, from a Locke of Volterra model. And indeed, they showed that they, with those models, they could then predict what happens in the future. So they, they did this really nice job of pulling out what are the interaction strengths and signs. And this is us just replotting them. So interaction strength, this is one. This is basically the strengths you interact with yourself. And basically, the vast majority of them are indeed weak. And moreover, when you actually look at the class of interaction, you're seeing exploitation and competition and very little cooperation, if any. So we see then, actually, what we would expect, at least from a simple ecological model, we see competition being dominant and weak interactions in the microbiome. So we see it's a stable system, and indeed it does make sense in the context of just ecology. So just for the last part, then, I'd like to um, ask one more question. And that is, OK, we do see that there's a lot of competition, which you expect in any ecosystem. But do we actually see any real examples of cooperation between species? And this is an ongoing sort of discussion in the literature and microbiology about how often two microbes cooperate. And actually, we think we have an important uh, interaction um, that is actually properly cooperative, even if it is in a minority. So this is what um, cooperation good example of cooperation between organisms looks like in nature. I took this on my holiday recently in Italy, and um, it was a very, uh, uh, you know, it, it captures the moment very well, at least if you're an insect nerd like me. This is what cooperation between species might look like in the microbiome. It's less, less beautiful, I'll give you, um, but hopefully I'll, uh, in the last few minutes I'll make it clear there's also beauty hidden within inside your guts. 
Um, so all you have to do is focus on this part. So this, these are the Bacteroides bacteria we're going to talk about, and these guys break down the complex carbohydrate in your lower intestine. And they do it with these extracellular enzymes. They have things that ha hold on to things, and also things that chop things, and then they pull them in. So they're taking complex carbohydrates, they're cutting them up, and they're pulling them in. And when they do this, um, in many cases, it's been shown, it's, it benefits the cell that's doing it. So there's many cases where they do this, either for the cell itself or the clone, it looks like. Just to emphasize how actually important and common these guys are, with this slightly creepy figure, I apologize, I didn't make it. Um, um, you have, basically, the vast majority of, of, of the bacteria, symbiotic bacteria, carry on your lower intestine, and the majority of those on the species scale are bacteroides, they're these bugs. So this big red thing here is only about 10 species or so that you carry. And so we're talking about the major players in, in the lower intestine, and indeed the major players metabolically for breaking down these complex carbohydrates. And so this got Seth, uh, a longtime collaborator of mine, and Laurie Comstock, who I, I couldn't find a, a picture of, um, interested in studying how these things happen and whether you could get cooperation in the system. And so what he did was he took a wild-type bacteria and started studying it. It's called Bacteroides ovatus. Okay, it'll, be, it'll be a few percent of the bugs in your lower intestine. And this guy basically breaks down something called inulin um, and releases monomers. Okay, so we can take this guy and we can grow it under various conditions. I apologize, it's a slightly complex figure. If you just grow it under pure inulin, it doesn't grow. You need to give it a little Kickstarter. But if you grow it with glucose, fructose, um, or another sugar, then it will actually start growing. Um, but the interesting thing is, normally, if you knock out these enzymes, the cells grow worse. But in this case, if you knock out the enzyme, the cells grow better. So in the key cases where you've got this induction of growth, you'll see they grow actually much better. And we do, there's a lot more work behind this, but the point is we find this evidence of a cost. These guys have got these dedicated enzymes that are secreting sugars out into the environment that they don't want. So it looks like costly cooperation. It looks like they're doing this for someone else. And we did a lot of, I say, there's a lot of work uh, behind this, but I want to show you one key experiment that gives you the idea that is, this is indeed going on. So what Seth did was he took germ-free mice, so these are mice that don't have any bugs in them, um, and then inoculated them with our two strains. So it's a slightly complicated experiment, but I'll go through it. Um, so what, they do, what he did first was you take the wild type that makes the enzyme and breaks down inulin, and then you put the mutant in together in co-culture. These are anaerobic experiments, and they're rather difficult, um, but nevertheless, he gets roughly 50-50 when he starts. So we're starting with a, with a, 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 a roughly equal ratio, ratio. You grow these guys on uh, polysaccharide-free chow, or food. They call it chow for some reason, um, in, in, in mouse experiments. And, um, and over time, you see a bit of a decrease. So certainly, you don't see an advantage to the wild type. Then, so there's no polysaccharide, then you can add inulin in. So now they need the enzymes, and you can ask, does this change the game? If you add inulin in, you feed this guy on an inulin diet, the polysaccharide, and no, it doesn't change. So you see, basically, these guys just tinker along. And the key experiment, as I say, there's a lot of work behind deciding this, was to say, what happens if you add another species into this, this monoculture, or sorry, um, co-culture system? And so, what Seth's done is he's added in, in Bacteroides vulgatus. And Bacteroides vulgatus is another very common guy that we know can make use of inulin and inulin breakdown products. And if you put that guy in, then suddenly you get this massive spike. The wild type does really well, and indeed, over time, will outcompete the mutant. And in short, what we think is going on then is a proper example of costly cooperation. So very easy to see in these cases, rather difficult to see inside a mouse, um, or indeed inside you, but we see that there is this interaction where one guy is investing in a costly trait to break down something that helps another, and then there's some feedback benefit which we haven't yet identified. Okay. So just to sum up then, um, I hope I've given you sort of a reasonable overview of how we think using social evolution about um, these sort of fascinating communities of microbes that are all around us and inside us. And just to run through um, the key points then, um, the first thing is uh, that we do see the sort of basic Hamiltonian arguments borne out in microbes and that they can generate related groups just by growing together and that, as, as they do. And this, we think, is a very important way that microbes solve the problem of cooperation. And on the scale of the little group, we can expect there to be a lot of investment in other cells, a little bit like a micro multicellular organism. That makes sense. But we also see that competition is going on, particularly between genotypes, or you know, this is the area we see it, and 
Under these conditions, they've evolved ways to discriminate and detect competition and respond adaptively. And as I say, we call this competition sensing. There'll be other mechanisms going on too. But the key point is they will detect attacks and induce counterattacks and other strategies. And this is actually, we think, going to be very important for understanding antibiotic resistance because these responses are to antibiotics and it helps cells defend themselves. Indeed, we have preliminary data to suggest that cells, when they engage in these responses, can become extremely resistant. And then finally, I sort, of, I sort of zoomed out a bit and argued that the host can be viewed as an ecosystem engineer, at least to some extent, that's manipulating communities for their benefit. But we see within there that we both that competition is important for ecologically, but also no doubt evolutionarily, but also there is a role for strong cooperation, particularly between these key players. And so, in some then, um, when we apply ecology and evolution to microbes, it all makes sense. You know, nothing I'm saying here should be hopefully surprising, but it's exciting to be um, studying these guys at this stage, because in some ways this is only just sort of starting now. So, very finally, I'd like to acknowledge members of my group, and indeed um, former group, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>